So San Diego Comic Con saw us not only getting the release of an Invincible Season 2 trailer, but we also got a special episode of the show on Prime Video. Titled Invincible Presents Adam Eve, this perfectly adapts a two issue comic series of the same name. The entry itself tells the origin story for Eve, and it centers around her discovering her past along with Elias Brandyworth. In one of the best trailer Easter eggs I've ever seen, you can actually catch the pair together if you go back to that first season 2 trailer. Sat to the left of the screen, we can see the pair together, and the creative team have confirmed that they did this to tease what was coming. They even were out here asking about theory time, so you know, I couldn't let them down when it came to a breakdown of this episode. Throughout this video, we're going to be going through everything that happens in it, and also discussing some of the changes from the comics. If you're as excited as I am to be talking about Invincible again, then please hit the thumbs up button, and don't forget to subscribe for breakdowns on season 2. Without the way, I'm your host Paul. Now let's get into Adam Eve. So the episode, it's almost like a one-to-one -one copy of the original comic, but it does start off differently to how the book began, in that we started immediately with Dr. Brandyworth escorting Samantha's mother into labour, whereas here we begin with a big action scene. Things start off with the Lizard League, which in case you don't know, are a play on the Serpent Society. Prince Lizard is voiced by Jacob Tremblay, and he also plays the part of Phase 2 later on. Now the Lizard League's first appearance in the comics actually had them trying to steal a canister, which is when they were stopped by both Invincible and Adam Eve. There we met the Lizard King, whereas this entry has Prince and Queen along with their subjects. Queen Lizard is voiced by none other than Tatiana Maslany, and this is the second time she's gone green in a comic book show recently with her also playing She-Hulk. They're joined by Salamander, who's played by Phil Lamar, and we learn that they're looking for a special serum. However, the reign of terror doesn't last too long, and lots of the main members of the Guardians of the Globe then drop in. When we last saw them, they were getting smashed like it was a like button, but here we see back in the day before Omni-Man played his hand. Amongst the ranks are Immortal Man and Aquarius, a play on Aquaman, but he's just a full-on fish. Now both are voiced by Ross Marquand, who you might know from Robert Kirkman's other big TV show, which is of course The Walking Dead. There's Black Samson, The Green Ghost, and lastly War Woman, who's also voiced by The Walking Dead's Lauren Cohen. Such a great way to kickstart the episode, and I think if you go back and watch this before starting season 1, it's going to add some extra oomph to when Omni-Man takes them all out. In the comics, they didn't actually die until issue 7, but Kirkman wanted to leave the first episode of the series with a, a breakneck twist. Sorry about that. Now they mention the Batman equivalent Darkwing, Flash counterpart Red Rush, and lastly Martian Man, who is a play on Martian Man Hunter. Duh. Now that they're putting up a good fight against them, we learn War Woman's called in the reserves in the form of Omni-Man. They have a little joke about all the heroes having the first letters of their names on their chest, which is of course seen in both Omni-Man and Immortal Man. This is also reflected in Mark with the Invincible having an eye on it that was actually meant to be a nod to the book's publisher Image Comics. They talk about Omni-Man's original white suit, which was worn by the Veltramites during their mission of conquest. Omni-Man's being given an update by the tailor, aka Art Rosenbaum, and in the series he's voiced by Mark Hamill. He was the one who gave Mark his iconic costume all the way back in episode 1, and I actually think they're doing a little joke about his lack of design skills. Why I'm saying that is because the letters on the chest thing plays off later on, as Adam Eve ends up having molecules as a symbol instead. She doesn't just go with this, the cliche letter thing, because she actually makes her own costume, and just shows how, how the tailor's kind of reduced to doing this with every hero. Now while all this is going on, we see what's happening on the other side of the Serpent Society attack. This is a slight differentiation from the comics, as there weren't any explosions when we joined them, but here the two events are tied together. We learn that Brandyworth originally just wanted a diversion from them, but it's gone far beyond that, whereas in the book they just rode out to the hospital. The journey was in an ambulance in the source material, whereas here it's in Brandyworth's car, and it allows them to at least have a heart to heart. Now it's during this that he promises to look after her child, and we also get similar moments that include the pink eyes. All parents have experienced pink eye in some form or another, but this is slightly different, and it signals off before she screams just before her apparent death. Now we'll discuss what happens later on, but in both moments Erickson ends up storming the hospital. Voiced by Lance Reddick, the actor sadly passed away earlier in the year. I'm not sure what his final performance is, as there are rumours he's going to be in the ballerina, but it did kind of bum me out realising he never got to see this. Now Brandyworth has passed the baby on to two parents, who as we learn have just lost their child. 
This is Adam and Betsy Wilkins, who will now raise Samantha believing that she's in fact theirs. Just like the comics, we end with a scene with them announcing her name, and at this point, we then cut to the titles. Invincible is now swapped out with Adam Eve, with us getting the atomic reorganisation that the character wields as her powers. I always kind of thought that she was loosely based on Molecule Man from Marvel Comics, as he could arrange matter at will and change the structure of objects. Might not be the case, but to Alice Phoebe Lou's Witches, we then get a montage of Samantha's early life. I'm guessing the Witches thing is not to Scarlet Witch, who of course also has reality warping powers. Now one of the scenes missing from the show is when Samantha's carried out the hospital and she looks over and sees Elias looking on from an alley. She calls out Baba and he then disappears, which gives us the idea that he's always going to look after her. Now in the show, he also ends up looking homeless later on, whereas in the comics, he, he always kept his lab coat. So I don't know, it was expensive to buy new clothes. So instead of the montage, we got her parents trying to get her to say her first words before we cut to the babysitter who's brought across perfectly for the show. Voiced by Philip Solomon, Zach realises she's a chemistry genius, which makes him insist to her parents they have to enrol her in a special school for youngsters. I always wondered if this was playing off Xavier's school for gifted youngsters, but we never see anyone with superpowers at the academy. Now in the comics it's called St. Francis's School for Exceptional Youths, whereas here it's named after Rosalind Franklin. This was a British chemist, and her work was paramount in understanding DNA. Both scenes in the show and book have Elias watching over her, but in the source material she sees him, whereas here she doesn't. Now from here we get to see Rogers and Erickson's experiments, and they're currently running a phase 2 test. Unlike Adam Eve, these new kids can manipulate living tissue, but this has left their skin and body in a constant state of flux. Almost completely confined to a stasis tube, he and his brother will grow to hate their sister because they don't live up to her. Anyway, from here the series adds a new character in Val, who didn't appear in the source material. In the comics, they cut from the shot of Elias at the school window to Eve at home in the aftermath of being kicked out. I actually really appreciate the addition of Val, and it kind of shows how Samantha wants a normal life. She realises she's never really going to be accepted though, and she feels isolated in both her school and social life. Now they do kind of play on the school quitting thing later on, but they alter things depending on what version you pick up. In both, Samantha calls the other kids at the school freaks, and her dad makes a comment about how she's one too. In the comics though, she storms out saying that she wishes she was adopted, which, hey, yeah, be careful what you wish for. Anyway, in both versions, she ends up discovering her powers at this point, with her turning a book into a glass in the episode. In the book, her mother brought her a sandwich, which she turned into a cheeseburger, which we then get playing out after the book test. Blown away by her powers, she then shows this off to Val, who's completely freaked out by what she can now do. It hammers home the idea that she is actually a freak, and it makes her decide to go on her own. Kicked out of school at this point, she goes to a regular one, and we see that she's got no mate. Her aunt does get her a lovely, lovely dress though, and this is brilliantly brought across from the comics, but in those, she then changes it into winter clothes. She also doesn't try and turn a squirrel into a puppy, but it does act well to actually lead into the next scene involving the dogs. In that she showed up with a black balaclava out of the blue, whereas here we see her making a mask and also developing her platform powers. They perfectly play out the scene with them even calling her a Powerpuff Girl, and their balaclavas then get turned into metal. Elias arrives at this point too, and we get a similar scene to what plays out in the comics. Now one missing thing I appreciated about the comics is that we had an Apple poster pinned up in the background. Adam Eve is obviously a play on Adam and Eve, and she's gaining knowledge like when they bit into the apple. Well that thought was worth bringing up, yeah, and also the comics have the dogs licking her, so appreciated that as well. Anyway, both go through Brandy Worth telling her the truth, with it clearly implying that Elias is her quote-unquote father. Throughout the entry, there's this idea of what it means to have a family, and the conclusion of the episode set up perfectly here. Now, both conversations come to a close, with Elias telling her not to use her powers, but in the show, they had a surveillance drone to heighten up the tension. We also don't get her returning home to her mother to show she's been sneaking out, and it further hammers home how alien that she feels. Now, due to Elias' revelation, she's now more disconnected from her family than ever, and Erickson's forces are also closing in. We get far more character development with the bad guys, whereas in the comics, they did sort of skip over them. Samantha is clearly caught up in Eliza's words too, and she goes looking for him amongst the homeless communities. In the book, we skipped all this and just went immediately from her leaving the conversation into fighting Kill Cannon. 
Now, ironically, he's voiced by the same guy that plays Samantha's dad in the show, and I don't know if thematically that's because both these guys look down on her. The similarities between Mark and Samantha end up becoming more apparent here too, as Kill Cannon's actually the first supervillain that both fought. Nice little bit of graffiti in the scene too, and you can actually catch a mural of War Woman on the wall. Now Adam Eve sticks his feet to the floor, just like the comics, and she also takes him out using her abilities. In the comics, it was at this point we cut to the Pentagon to get a riff on the scene that we had with Erickson before. Taking down Kel Cannon was what alerted him of Samantha, and we saw him ordering the specimens to be readied. Now from here, Sam and Elias go to Bergamot, which is where Mark ends up working in the first season. This was the location he also discovered his powers at, and mirrored here is Samantha now learning the truth. Now Elias lies that Sam's mother was a valued lab partner, but we see that she was a homeless woman that they ran experiments on. We actually only got a single panel of her getting approached on the streets, and the rest of this backstory in the comics was completely missing. To me, it really helps to flesh out everything, and it adds to the themes centred around family. Kirkman's often said he's cleaning up the story for the show, and doing things with the hindsight of knowing the whole plan. It really works too, and as she flies out we can see a poster on the wall for the Green Ghost. Now in the comics, issue 1 ended with her storming away at this point, and issue 2 picked up with a fight between her and her family. In the comics, we got a quick cameo of Capes Incorporated, but I'm guessing they cut this out just to streamline the story. Kinda get a play on the Avengers. Um, fall back and, um, form a perimeter or something. I need a perimeter as far back as 39th. Why the hell should I take orders from you? What? Get the hell out of here! I need men in those buildings. Lead the people down and away from the streets. You got it. We're gonna set up a perimeter all the way down to 39th Street. We fall back and form a perimeter. Great idea. And it leads to a big fight between her and all her family. In the show, they're way more monstrous than how they were in the comics, and I also think the fight animations are incredible. It has them really busting out all the stocks to bring us a thrilling fight, and I have to say, Invincible's fight animations are absolutely incredible. Now both battles end with it feeling like a loss, and this is due to all the characters withering away before they eventually die. Atom Eve also creates a sort of power armor suit, and it shows how versatile that her powers are. He's basically uh, an overpowered Green Lantern, and the other phases are right, she's way better than they are. Now they say Brandyworth's not her family, but we see at the end how Eve sees them as that. They do beat the crap out of her at one point, but she is saved by Elias, and this leads to phase 2 being the last one alive. In the end, both Adam Eve and Brandyworth are taken out by Erickson, which is when we learn the truth about Samantha's mother. Stored in a containment cell, it's a horrifying fate, and she's been sentenced to her basically just being used as a womb. It's completely horrendous, and in all honesty, if you know the story of Samantha, then you'll know her life is filled with tragedy like this. Her adoptive parents are of course dicks, and yet lots of terrible stuff happens with the character. Now from here, both her mother and Brandyworth are killed in front of her, and this forces her to go super sign like how she does in the comics. Becoming like the Dark Phoenix, she's now completely godlike, and she erases both the bad guy's memories in one fell swoop. In the comic, she says to Brandyworth and her mother, I'm sorry mum and dad, I love you, before flying off. Really plays up the family angle, and yeah, I thought I'd add that in to point out all the family connection. Now, that also has a snake crawling through her mask, which I always took to play on the Adam and Eve thing that we brought up before. Let me know if you agree, but yeah, that is kind of how, how I interpreted it. Either way, upon returning home, we see that her parents haven't forgotten her birthday, and though they've ate some of her cake, she does see that they still care for her. Just like in the comics, her dad says they're the only family she's got, and she ends up changing the photo of them to one of her quote-unquote real family. We end with a line, only one I've got in the comics, which is also in the show, but here they actually add something in that's a really touching moment. Getting a hug from her mother, she promises it'll be alright, and it shows that she at least cares for her. Now in addition to the story, we then get a little epilogue that wasn't included in the source material. Joining Omni-Man, we see as he returns home, and Mark runs in pretending to be Duct Tape Man. Hilarious way to end the episode, but it does come with a tragic side, cause we know what Omni-Man is eventually gonna go ruin. He gets angry for a second, before he starts to face Palm, as he of course knows it's not too long before it's all gonna come crashing down. And this of course plays further into the themes of family, and how Samantha's desperate to have one, whereas he'll happily throw us away. It's a brilliant way to end the episode, and also our breakdown, and uh, what, a, 
What a great standalone episode that this really was. I'm really hoping this becomes a regular thing, and with the breaks in between seasons, we get these sort of standalone stories. There's lots of them in the Invincible world as well, and I think it would be the perfect way to get these in between the entries. I hope you've enjoyed us going through it too, and if you have, then please hit the thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe for the breakdowns in November as well, and if you want to support the channel as a member of the Spoiler Society, then please click the join button. You'll get early access to videos every single week, and it goes such a long way to helping us out. We also have our merch store over at shopzeroedition.com, which sells lots of nerdy inspired t-shirts, hats and more. We just launched a Secret Invasion slash Pulp Fiction inspired t-shirt, so if you want to head over there and help us out, then the link's in the description. Now if you want something else to watch, we've got a breakdown of the Marvels trailer linked on screen right now, so definitely head over there right after this. By the way, huge thank you for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, I'll see you next time. You take care of yourself, peace.